Steve mentioned that you talked to his course yesterday yep. about the value of a liberal arts degree in, yep. in humanitarian work in particular. Can you talk a little bit about that now and, and sure. really um, what you took with you from MSU out into the real world, so to speak? Well, Chris, it's, it's a question I get a lot. Um, I'm with the UN and I'm on a sabbatical and I spend a lot of time um, talking to students because I'm based at a university and I'm you know, teaching courses on hunger and poverty and it's always a question that comes up. How did you get there and what did you do? And, Whenever I do any kind of talk like that or career seminars, I always start with the fact that I'm a liberal arts grad and mm -hmm. proud of it. The secret is that all of us are in my line of work. Most humanitarian workers, development aid workers, n number one, you, you couldn't specialize. You, you couldn't get a degree in development back then anyway. But the fact is that all of us really today are uh, liberal arts grads. And the reason for that is that we can hire all the specialty technicians we want on consultancies, but we can't afford usually to have them on staff because they're too specialized. What we need are those folks who can pull it all together. And that is the, the gift of the liberal arts education in that you are trained, whether you like it or not, to write well. And I learned to write here. I learned to write. I learned to express myself. I learned critical thinking, you know, broader looking. I, I, I learned to, uh, to, to speak, to present my, my views. This is all well, well-rounded education, and many agencies like us need those kind of people. Indeed, mm -hmm. our core staff, because um, we're dealing with interdisciplinary issues all the time, uh, complicated subjects. There's never a, a black and white issue. Everything is gray, and I've seen this time and time again. We find that liberal arts grads generally are just the best equipped. And again, nothing against the more technical expertise side. Uh, and if anything, it's the liberal arts grads like us who will bring them all together because we need them. We can't do it all ourselves. But then we will be managing the process oftentimes because we will often have that broader perspective. So obviously there will be famines related to weather and to things that are not man-made. But for the man-made ones, is this a moral failing of governments? What is this? And how? what's the ultimate solution to it? Well, again... You really have to look at the different the different situations around the world. The Horn of Africa again is sort of topical right 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 now on the front page. But even in, in the United States, isn't, or in the United isn't States. this a moral failing of our government that we have people starving? Well, the way I the way I like I like to to explain it or at least talk about it with the students who I teach, is that it's important to step back from the moral failing idea. I mean, there are moral obligations, I think, and there are the ethics of simply helping. But in our view, there's no sin to have hungry or, or starving or, or hungry or poor people in your, in your country. All countries do, whether they want to admit it or not. It's a question of degree. What for us is much more important to focus on is what are the people in charge? What is the government doing about it? And, and so, so again, everyone has the hungry and the poor, but what are they doing? For example, what are the social safety nets? What programs are there in the central government and all levels of government to work with those people and help them, you know, on their own terms, improve their, their lot in life? And as, you, as we know, uh, in many Western countries, such as this one, um, there are programs like, like that, maybe nowhere near able to meet the need and less and less so all, all the time uh, on the food side and, you know, much of what I teach in my hunger studies courses is vulnerability. I maybe won't get my students to live in a tent in Darfur, and nor should I, but I can teach many of the vulnerability issues as to why the poorest, the most food insecure in this country, for example, are affected, because they are affected differently. Mm -hmm. I live in Alabama currently, which has mm -hmm. the highest obesity rates in the, in the country. These people are hungry. This, this is a hunger issue. They are mm -hmm. malnourished. My students say, well, wait a minute, they're eating calories. <laughs> What's in the calories? That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It's lack of education, always, and awareness. Mm -hmm. People are stressed. It's the phenomenon of the working poor in the U.S. today, making poor choices. They're working. They're earning money. They're not making it for lots of reasons. It's always like, what's their fault, or it's his fault, or her fault, or the government's fault. Well, okay, whose ever fault it is, the fact is it, it's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so in richer countries, clearly, what can be done? And so that's much of what I'm trying to do with our work here in this country now is, is through this awareness, getting students out in the community to see firsthand. Then they develop that, not just the compassion, it's not just that, but just what can be done and what am I looking at? And so then they can become advocates in terms of public policy with their governments. 
And to me, this is the key, is having more aware advocates on behalf of these people who are voiceless in many cases, disenfranchised, they're not really in, in the system, so that those who are, like educated college students and others, mm -hmm. as members of a democracy, can make this known to the powers that be, that yes, this is right what we're doing, we need to do more of it and do it better. And of course, in many countries, you don't have that. And right. that's the problem again. It is a moral failure then. Right. People are too scared to speak up. Governments are not, are not engaged, and they should be. Uh, you use the phrase, the end of hunger, the end of world hunger. Is that a real thing? Absolutely. How it's completely you, possible. How to get there? How we get there <laughs> is simply work on the access distribution issue with, with food. There's enough food to feed everyone in the world. There has been for many, many years. There won't be very much longer, so we have a window, we have an opportunity. So world hunger can be stopped, but it's going to be more difficult to stop it and end it soon. And by 2050, for sure, we'll have more people on the planet than we can feed. For now, our problem is, the world's problem is this distribution, access to that food, and being able to understand better and then target the needs of those who are most affected. And women, children, the most vulnerable, again, in any society, Native people, uh, minorities, one key program is simply providing good nutrition to children, to uh, mothers, women, and also um, channeling much of that good nutrition through school as well, so nutrition plus education, mm -hmm. and then educating girls. And actually, if, if anyone ever asks me, is there the magic pill, is there just one program, and of course there isn't just one, probably the most important thing we can do as a society is educate girls. Mm -hmm. We've seen extreme cases in Italy and Germany with negative, with negative fertility rates now mm -hmm. that um, the more highly educated the female population is of a country, they will have fewer children. And those children they do have will be more healthy and more educated themselves, and they'll educate their own daughters, and it goes on. That is actually the way we will deal with so many aspects of world development, poverty, and the population issue as well, all together, mm -hmm. plus the food supply problem. It's incredibly challenging because so much of it, it gets back to humanities and liberal arts training again, is appreciating all the aspects of culture that affect this, that, that impact on the realities of the situation and why it doesn't work. For example, in very conservative countries, uh, and I mean conservative from, from a you know, political but also religious point, point of view, mm -hmm. where the role of women in particular is, is, uh, is a key issue, so they are second-class citizens. In some of these more conservative countries with school feeding programs, where we're providing nu nutritious food in the early days of them being in school, that'll act as an incentive to get the children into school, but maybe not the girls. Even worse, even to keep them there. So they might go for a brief time, maybe a year or so, but then they'll be taken off mm. by their parents. There's not a value on educating girls. So in some countries, We've evolved a program I, I sort of jokingly call, um, but it's serious, the Dad's Blackmail Program. And it's, it's an incentive program to get girls in school and keep them there. And we provide a liter of cooking oil every month to the girl, and it's for the family, it's to give it to the father. And believe it or not, that right there will be enough really? for who's in charge, the father, to not only send her there, but keep her there. It's very simple. Now, you think about it. Now, that's a liter of cooking oil. That's valuable. Cooking oil mm -hmm. is used every day. It also tells you a little bit about the decision process in mm -hmm. the family because that's all it takes is the, <laughs> the cooking oil. So they may not really want to do that, but they'll do it for that reason. Mm -hmm. We make no apologies. That's enough. That's fine, right? Because the end result will be a, a group of educated women. Who will then, in turn, mm -hmm. educate their, their girls. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing this long enough. The beauty of it now is that we now have women, mothers, sending their girls because they were mm -hmm. part of those programs. Mm -hmm. and, and it works. Across countries, across cultures, does, everywhere in the world. It does. Mm -hmm. It does, yeah. There are lots of other ways as well, but that sure. is one that we find in our line of work working with Food Aid that's very effective. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have a lot of meetings and a lot of talk and all that too, and a lot of that works too. Mm -hmm. But you can't force families to educate their kids mm -hmm. and their girls. It's all about bringing out the solutions from them, right? Because mm -hmm. the expat, me, you know, arriving with my tie and <laughs> my Land Cruiser and my staff and all that, uh, we're not the solution. And we fool ourselves if we think that we always are. And the reason you know that it's working is that when you turn your head or you go away or you pull your funding or you leave, and they still continue it, and then the central government puts money into it, mm -hmm. then you know. That's how we define sustainable development.